Well, hello everyone, this is Alfadi, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this new series that we have entitled MBS, The Great Reformer of Islam. Of course, we're talking about the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, where I come from, and uh, quite uh, frankly, I am so impressed by uh, the big vision that he has for my country, and that's known also as Vision 2030. And last time, myself and Dr. J here in studio, we unpacked the um, portions of his um, you know, amazing interview that took place on April 27th uh, of 21. And uh, this interview have gone viral because of some of the uh, content that were discussed in it. With that in mind, uh, let's turn our attention now to Dr. J. Dr. J, we talked about the big vision but there is also a big elephant in the room that comes with that big vision as well, or at least will be counter to that vision. Yeah, so here is the big vision. These are all the promises that he has given and that he's actually fulfilling. He's talking about Neom, we're talking about these enormous structures, these buildings that are multi star I mean, these skyscrapers and Riyadh and in Jeddah, and they're up in the Gulf of Aqaba. But Budaifa, the man who's having this show, he, uh, for after an hour of unpacking everything that MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, has done and con will continue to do for the next nine years. This is what he did for the first six. Yeah. Now this is what he's going to do for the next nine. Yeah. He then turned to him the last half hour. That's Abdullah Mudaifar, the host. The host. Yeah, turned uh, to MBS and asked question. He asked this the million dollar question, the elephant that was sitting in the room, the question that I was asking, and that is, well, hold on a minute, this all is very well and good, but remember, Saudi Arabia is where the two holy places are. That's correct. This is where Mecca Medina is, this is the Hijaz, this is the where all the millions of pilgrims come to for the Hajj. This is the bastion of of Islam. This is where Muhammad lived. This is where the all the traditions are created. This is everything that Islam is dependent on is this country. And this is where all the radical Muslims and the extremists, this is what they look to as really the source for everything they do. And so Madaifa said, what about the extremists? Which is really a fair question to ask, obviously. We were all asking it. I was asking it. I was wondering what's going to happen to him. I was thinking, hold on, hold on a minute. This guy What's going to happen to him? Is he going to be dethroned? Is he going to be thrown out? Is his father going to shut him down? Is And yet, this has been a number of months now that the interview is out, and there's been no repercussions. Well, actually, I think he is headed in the right direction, and he has a lot of support. You know what's going to his advantage? The majority of the population is young, and they are open-minded, and they're excited about these kind of changes. Okay, we're going to get to that. In yeah. fact, I'm going to talk about that, because that's something that's fascinating, what you're bringing up. But nonetheless, you still got to talk about the extremists. You still got to talk about Absolutely. the Salafis. You still got to talk about the Wahhabis. Now, explain the, who the Wahhabis are. Well, the, I mean, the Wahhabis, uh, I mean, we call them Wahhabis. They're, they're the Salafi. Why do we call them Salafi? The, the, anywhere you hear about the Salafi movement is a movement it's a Reformation movement, if you wish, taking you back to the 7th century Islam. That's called the Salaf, meaning the early Muslims. Let's, let's call it like the church fathers, you know. That's the Muhammad's, uh, basically, time, his companions and their followers. And this is kind of like, you, you can call it the golden age. If you want to know Islam and if you want to follow it perfectly, that's the model to follow. That's why it's called the Salaf, going back to that model. Now, Wahhabi is named after a reformer. His name is Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. As a matter of fact, he's the one who had a pact, a covenant, if you wish, with the founder of the Saudi family, uh, the, the Saudi uh, uh, the First Kingdom, uh, where the country is named after him, Muhammad bin Saud. I mean, uh, Imam Muhammad bin Saud and Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab had a pact, a handshake. Abdul Wahhab says, let me handle the religious affairs. Mohammed bin Saud says, okay, we'll handle the political affairs, and it's been like this ever since. Now, uh, Ever since. We're talking about 1700. That's so right. this is 400 years. This is not just recently. This is not just in our lifetime. We're talking about 400 years ago this pact was created, and this Almost, is a pact yeah. of bringing the mosque and state together, isn't it? That's not? right. Exactly. So the, the, the family of Mohammed bin Abdul Wahhab, known as al-Sheikh, the family of al-Sheikh, meaning the clerk, are the ones, till this day, who head the religious police. 
and Al Saud or the House of Saud is the one that handles the political affairs. Now, Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab was disturbed by what was going on in Saudi because, like you said, it's the holy, uh, the, the the host of the holy lands, uh, the holy mosques, and therefore he felt like there are some innovations, if you wish, and he went on to do reformation and change things and even persecute those who devised new ways of worship mm. against the Salaf, you know. Yeah. That, so the movement is known as the Wahhabi movement, and that's why some of the Salafis in Saudi are labeled as Wahhabis. Okay, so you have this, and this is what I wanted to bring this question up. I wanted to bring him up, and I sat there and said, I couldn't believe it, he's asking this question on national television. This is going to go all over the Islamic world, and certainly, though it was in Arabic, it was in English subtitles. Mm -hmm. Everything he said was in English subtitles. And when he asked the question, I, well, this is fascinating because just look at nonverbals. The first hour, every once in a while, he, he'd do this. He'd, 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 you know, pull up his chin, uh, you know, to... Well, it's got to get tight uh, after a while, to be honest with you. Yeah. And he would do that. Yeah. Once he asked this question, he almost almost like doing it every second. You could see that there's, he was nervous. And this is, this is what I guess is what, uh, what his it's way of... a tough of, question. You could see he was pausing. He was thinking through exactly how he's going to answer this. You can see, and when we pause, we say um or ah uh, or mm, yeah. You know, we do we the, we have these kind of intermediate words that we put in there uh, to hold on, so we can think about how we're going to answer it. His way of doing it was to pull up his chin, and he kept on doing this, kept on doing this, and I can see you can see he was being very careful how he's going to answer this. Yeah. And this, the question was, what about the Wahhabis? What about the extremists? Aren't they going to react? Aren't they going to confront you because you're going against everything that they believe, everything that they stand for? And so this is what he said. We have a constitution. And that constitution is the Quran. Right. The Quran is our constitution. Everything we do must be dictated by the Quran, he said. Then he thought a little bit more. And as for the traditions, because Mudaifa then came back on him that time. I said, well, okay, what about the Hadith? What about the Sira? What about the Tafsir? What about the Tahrik? The, these four genre of what we know as the Islamic traditions. What are you going to do about that material? Because that material is how we, basically, is how all Muslims are to walk, talk, drink, eat, sleep. Everything they do 24-7 is dictated by the practice, the example of the Prophet himself. And the example of the Prophet comes from the Sira, which is biography, and the most of it comes from the Hadith, because that is the enormous amount of, of Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tirmidhi, all these enormous right. amount of, of material that is on every aspect of life. That's how you live. That's how you work. This is what they have to go to, to know how they're to to treat their children, how they're to treat their wife, how they're to treat their, their opponents. Everything that is dictated by life is in the traditions. That's what the Salafis use. That's what the Wahhabi dictate. And this has been, they've been dictating this for 400 years. What are you going to do about those traditions? Mm -hmm. So he stopped and thought, and he did a bit of this with his neck. And then he said, there are three levels of tradition. We have Sahih, like Sahih Buhari, Sahih Muslim, the six major compilations of the Hadith, that's Sahih, which are un unquestioned. You don't question them because they are perfect. Underneath that is Hassan. You can question that a bit. And then below that is Taif. That you can question all because it's very weak. Three right. different levels of Hadith. You know, you know this. Everybody who has studied Islam knows these three different levels. And as far as for the bottom two, he pretty much was willing to throw them out because they're nothing more than man-made. That's why they are middle and weak. But the top one, the, the Sahih, what are you going to do with that? Because that should be unquestioned. But he says, we're going to dictate and we're going to relegate anything that is Sahih. We're going to use the Quran as our litmus. We're going to use the Quran to be able to go to use as the standard by which all the Sahih will be, will be tested. So anything that agrees yeah. with the Quran, we'll keep. Anything that doesn't agree with the Quran, we'll throw out, is what so he was saying. the Quran will become the sieve that you're going to filter the remaining, basically, portion of Hadith, which is Sahih in this case. And even out of that, you'll be left with few. Okay, and that's what's happened. Now, since April 27th, I've been looking at different articles that have been coming up. I've been looking at people who are reacting to it, and I've been looking at what scholars are saying. What scholars are saying this, if he is now dictating that the only those Hadith 
will be followed that that are supported by the Quran. He's become a Quran only, uh, Quranist. Quranist is the name that is given to that. It's been around since the 1800s. Uh, well known. We know some famous Quor- uh, Quranists. Uh, Shabir Ali, Dr. Shabir Ali would be a Quranist. Uh, he is the one that's very clear. He's very clear that he doesn't go back to the Hadith anymore. He only goes to the Quran. So you might say that MBS has become a Quranist, is what he was saying in this interview. And it's really a brilliant answer because uh, instead of saying anything that could be perceived negative against the Prophet, all you're saying is, we do understand that there might be some questionable hadith in there, and we have to use the Quran now as that go back to standard. So, off the top of your head, if you're only going to use those hadith that are sahih and only those sahih that are co- correspond with the Quran, how many hadith are we talking about? What percentage would you guess, just off the top well, of your head? You know, it's going to be a very small percentage for sure. Okay, I mean, a very small percentage. You know what the scholars 10, are saying? 20, 30 percent, maybe something like that. You know what the, the scholars are saying? <laughs> if you go up and see what yeah. all the scholars are saying, they're saying this would relegate only 10 percent of the hadith, therefore, are authoritative. Yeah. 10 percent. But, you know, here's, here's the beauty, uh, uh, you know, about this, um, uh, Jay. Uh, I mean, I want, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, think realistically here. Isn't this what everybody's been hoping for. Hold on, well, you're, you're jumping ahead. I don't want yeah, to talk but, about but I'm saying, I mean, isn't this what everybody's been hoping for? I so do, but I don't want to talk like about that yet. definitely hidden in that direction. I don't want to talk about that yet. Yeah. You're coming, in some way, you want to get to the next episode. I want to save that because <laughs> this is where, this is, I mean, what you're bringing up is where we all want to go and I can see why you're excited by it, yeah. but I still want to talk about that 10%. Only 10% of the traditions you're holding on to, the other 90% you're already throwing out. And we're talking about the Sahih, you've already thrown out the Hassan and the Taif. You're only talking about 10% of that which is left behind. That 10% is relegated to what the Quran says. You become a Quranist right there and then. Here's the next question, and this is what Mudaifa said, okay? So who's going to dictate what that 10% is? He didn't say 10%. He didn't know that. He, I don't even think he knows that. But who's going to dictate what we keep and what we throw away? The Wahhabis? Is it the Wahhabis that are going to be have that jurisdiction? And I loved looking at um, MBS because then he really got nervous. And this is what he said. Why is it that we have relegated one group, one man, as the arbiter between man and God? It's amazing. This, this answer, what really an answer. is amazing. Amazing. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's fascinating to me. And I pray for his protection because uh, he's definitely standing against the, uh, the tight, uh, the, the mainstream for sure. Because you have not only now the radical Wahhabis who are upset, obviously. You have the Muslim Brotherhoods who want to take advantage of that and say, you see, you know, we are now the whole beholders of Islam. You have the Shia represented by Iran who probably want to present him, uh, to themselves as the genuine form of Islam. So you have a lot of waves that probably will try one way or another to antagonize this movement. But he went one step further. Yeah. He didn't just stop there. Yeah. He said, Wahhab himself, Ahmed bin Wahhab, Abdul Wahhab. Yeah. He would have been enormously upset by what we're doing. Yeah. He would be. Ro- he didn't say rolling his grave. I'm saying that. He would be rolling in his grave if he knew what we were doing with his name. No man, no man should be an arbiter between man and God. And that's the very thing he was against. He was against anybody as an intermediary. It should be the Quran and only the Quran. Therefore, who's going to interpret the Quran? Not Wahhab from 400 years ago. What he said next was, we should be able to interpret it for every age and every day. Each jihad should not be closed. Each jihad should be open. Help people understand, what is each jihad? Yeah, each jihad is basically one of the uh, school of thought in Sharia. So if you find something that is available, like a ruling in the Quran, you go by that. If you find a ruling in the Quran and the Hadith, now it strengthens your case. But let's say you do not find a specific ruling for a specific action. Uh, that's where the role of ishtihad can, uh, you know, uh, become handy. Meaning, you as an individual, uh, or maybe it's a school, you can say, well, okay, so we, we want to come up with a ruling in accordance to these, you know, other rulings. You know, this resembles this action, or mm-hmm. this may appear to be like that action. Example, drug dealing. 
Well, there isn't a specific ruling for drug dealing, but some will take it as uh, as extreme as, uh, well, it's almost like highway robbery. Mm. It uh, destroys peace in the community, and therefore, what's the punishment for highway robbery? Beheading, you know, or banishment from the land? You do the same thing. So that's kind of a form of ijtihad. You kind of like come up with your own ruling or maybe a group of clerks will decide this is the best way to handle this particular one. But it will vary from age to age, no doubt so about that. So this is called interpretation of scripture. Exactly. Basically, we're going to take the ruling, we're going to look at scripture, we're going to look at the Quran, and we're going to look at the Sahih, the correspondence, and then we're going to decide how you interpret that. Exegesis is what yeah, we Yeah, doing use. your best, basically. Ishtihad is kind of like doing your best judgment to how to handle this. But it's not going to be an ijtihad from 1700 AD. It's going to be an ijtihad that is for today, for this time, and for this place, and for these people. See, now that's taken it even a step further. Because Bingo. it's not like you're going back to, okay, so what did Ibn Taymiyyah say about this? No. What do we say today? No, Ibn Taymiyyah from 1300, Wahhab from 1700, we're now in the 21st century. Okay. And look who's saying it. This is not a Wahhabi saying it. This is not a scholar, a religious scholar. This is MBS saying that. So right. MBS is saying we, we. Now, who is he we? Well, he's talking about himself. Yeah. We're going to interpret for today. Woo! Yeah, I mean, yeah. talk about chewing. I'm, 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 I'm taking more than you can chew. This guy is really putting his foot forward. And, of course, hearing that, if I was a Wahhabi or if I was a Salafist or if I was any radical or extremist listening to what he's saying, I would be angry. And uh, interestingly, almost all of the pro comments after the end of my, I put it up now in three different sessions, three different times I've impacted. I've, I love to look at the comments. In fact, those of you who are watching, go and comment on this. I want to see what your comments are. I want to see what you say. If you're a Muslim, comment. You've got the comments down there. Yeah, I want to hear how you would react to this. But don't just react to this with a knee-jerk reaction. I want you to think through what we're going to say, because now we're going to unpack it, because I want us to react to this. Yeah. Now, on face value, I would react like 90% or almost 98% to 99% of those who uh, comments have made. And what they're saying is, this guy cannot succeed. There's no way in the world that he can succeed. There's nothing that he can do. That They're all saying that, and that's the knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, but I would I would disagree. In okay, fact, but I, hold on. I want to talk about that in the next well, episode. Well, let me say this. I mean, I, I want to just tell people I would disagree with their comments because in the next episode, I will share more in depth why uh, their comments uh, actually are uh, erroneous because they're still living the past. They're not aware of what's going on in the present time and what is the future of Saudi will be. And see, this is what I want to get to. I yeah. think this guy has something. I think there's something yeah. happening here that we need to pay attention to. And we need to pay attention because I like to go over in the next episode, I like to look at and unpack that. Why we think that maybe MBS is onto something here. Maybe he will he is starting a new reformation in Islam, but there is another elephant in the room. Right. I'm not gonna say what it is. It's yet to come. Stay with us. Thank you, as always, brother and hope everyone is enjoying this uh, really exceptionally special uh, video series. And, you know, uh, I, I want to emphasize the following. Me and Jay are not doing this for political reasons, so this is not a political show. We're actually excited because it's taken Islam now into a different direction that we've been praying for and hoping for for the longest time, and that's pulling extremism out of Islam and beginning to reason with Islam in human fashion, face to face, logically speaking, talking about the issues and with an open mind, which is really the best way for us to interact with our Muslim uh, friends, my, myself, Muslim family, uh, my Muslim cousins, uh, everyone that is in Saudi, for instance, my homeland, I love Saudi, I love my government over there, and I am even more excited about what MBS is doing because I care for my people, and it seems to me that he is becoming a man of peace if he continues along these lines. With that in mind, let's wait until next episode to talk about yet another problem that might try to push back against this vision by MBS. Until next time. Have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell 
so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.